So, this structure chart is a decomposition of a general problem for solving a party. And in industry, one of the reasons why problems are decomposed are twofold. First of all, there could be subtasks that are easy to do and subtasks that are very complex and that require long-term study and analysis in order to come up with the methodology or the algorithm to solve the problem. Also in industry, very often teams can work in tandem to solve a larger problem. Uh, a team could be working on the place location uh, determination, getting the refreshments, another team recording the music, and inviting friends. Independent of one another and simultaneous. But the nature of our solution is not necessarily that straightforward. For example, we cannot invite friends until we find a place. But we can record the music independent of time and place, perhaps. Another thing you should note is that getting refreshments depends upon both finding a place first and inviting friends so that we have a number of people who are going to attend to let us know how much refreshments we can buy. Also, the place for the party may dictate the kind of booze, I mean the kind of drink that we can buy. So, a lot depends upon how the analyst has decomposed the problem and the decomposition of the problem can dictate the algorithms that are behind each of these subtasks. Let me show you an algorithm that's behind one of our subtasks. Here is the algorithm that is the step-by-step -step approach over a finite amount of time to solve the problem of finding a place. Notice here it flows very much like our previous algorithm numbered one through four. I got a little bit of a problem with two threes here. Just a typo. And here we have a branch saying if the VIP room is available, we take this branch. If it's not, we take this. But this particular branch is in itself a sequence. So constructs, the ones that we've been looking at so far today, can be combined. Here is a branch or selection construct with a sequential or block of instructions within them. Also notice that our pseudocode is written in very short phrases, beginning in most cases with a verb. Something else I want to point out to you about our algorithm is that algorithms will typically begin with something in regard to input, the body of which is some process, and end with some kind of output. So we see here input, process, output. Basic construct, basic format for putting together an algorithm. So we can see here implicit in this algorithm that there is a piece of data that's input dates and times for the party, and a piece of data that's output, the actual date of the party when it has been booked or not booked. Another algorithm for solving the problem for inviting friends is another construct very much like the previous one. We see here our looping construct again where we do while there are names in the address book, what do we do? We do 2A through 2D over and over again each time adding one to a person counter. That person counter starts out at zero, never needless to say. And once all the names in the address book are exhausted, the people are called and determined whether or not they're going to need a envelope and an invitation, we have the number of people who are going to attend the party and we return that back to the calling program, in this case you as the organizer of the party. So we see ourselves in this whole
whole decomposition of the party preparation process as being a controlling or main function. That main function gives control to various sub-functions, and when those sub-functions get the input, they process it and return an output that is later used by the calling or main function, me, organizer of the party, to execute or send to another function. Getting food very much is a sequential process. I won't go over that in some detail. Again, I'll ask you to look at these on the, slot, on the, on the web. But here is our structure chart with input and output parameters. What do we mean by input and output parameters? Well, let's take a look at the subtask for finding a place for the party. One of its inputs was the date and day to the time for the party. And its return was a place, date, and time. So we gave it multiple dates. It found, the, meaning the subtask, found a place and selected one of the dates and times and returned it back as what we call a output parameter back to the calling or main function here. I'm using these words, you know, for a particular reason. Main function. You'll see those as words used in your book in Chapter 1 and in C++ programming in general. So now, with the date and time, the calling function or main function cannot execute the get refreshments function because it does not have the number of people. It can get the number of people only after it has given execution control to the invite friends subfunction. So the invite friends subfunction gets the information place, date, and time from the main main having received it from the find place for the party and then executes the function of inviting friends incrementing the person counter at the end of that invitation process the number of people is known and that number of people plus the limit of spending and the date and time are given to the get refreshments why does get refreshments need to know the date and time? Well, of course, because they need to have the food ready on that date at that time. Why do they need to know the? They don't need to necessarily know the place, but if they were being, if this function was also incorporating the delivery of the food, they also need to know the place and as well as the place, the place, the time, and the date. So now the get refreshments person, if you can look at this as people being assigned functions for a party preparation could then get two of their friends, one of them to go get the food, and another one of them to go get the drinks for the party. Those information, information will be gathered on the total cost, and of course the total cost returned back to the calling function. Notice that there are no input parameters to the record music subfunction, and that's because this subfunction doesn't require any input. It can just function independent of all the others and needs no input or, but, Another reason why I didn't put input parameters here is because this is going to be your homework. I want you to construct an algorithm for recording music and one of the input parameters for this should be the length of time for the party. Three hours, four hours, five hours, six hours. And one of the outputs from this should be the recorded music. So that algorithm is due week from, I should say, next Monday. So this coming Monday, I believe this coming Monday is September 1st? Is that a holiday? Which is, so it's Wednesday, September 3rd. All right, so Wednesday, September 3rd. Type it out, bring it to class. We can also have it emailed. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that. Perhaps we can have that assignment emailed as well. Here we see another structure chart, more information systems related, for a payroll system. Here we have decomposed the process of a developing a payroll system into subsystems, paying commissions, bi-weekly payroll, interfacing with accounting, reporting, and we've taken the bi-weekly payroll and decomposing that down into two of its subtasks, that is getting data by which we will process to use process and use for bi-weekly payroll 
and computing weekly wages. Notice I have weekly wages here in red, and I do that because I have produced an algorithm for that subproblem, and I've given that subproblem to a programmer on my team who has now been assigned to write an algorithm for employees' weekly wages and determine how those calculations would be done by hand. So what I've tried to do here is to outline a task for a person on my staff, but I've given them a task that implies a verification of their solution. So I've asked them to come up with this algorithm to solve it, but to verify that algorithm by hand calculation. And I emphasize this because in each of the assignments that you're going to have over the course of the 14 weeks of this course, you will have to prepare an algorithm before you write a computer program, and you will have to test that algorithm by hand and show me this homework in written form before you are allowed to begin programming. So if I were the programmer given this task, I would simply take maybe even my own payroll and attempt to calculate it. I have, in this particular hypothetical week, worked 52 hours. And of course, everything over 40 is overtime. So I first multiply my hourly rate of 24.75 times the first 40 hours I worked. I got $990. I then took the 12 overtime hours multiplied them times the overtime rate, which is time and a half, or 1.5. And now I've multiplied that times my rate of $24.75. And so my total payroll for that biweekly period is $1,435.50. So now, having done this by hand, I should be able to come up with a more detailed algorithm that can be expressed in part by a formula. And that formula is including this statement. If hours are more than 40, then wages equals 40 times pay rate plus hours. That's at 52. Minus 40, which gives us a 12. 12 times time and a half times the pay rate. Adding them together. That's how I got the 1435.50. Written in more pseudocode, the algorithm looks like the following. And this is an expanded algorithm. We get the employee's hourly rate, we get the hours worked that week, we calculate the regular wages, which was the first of the formulas on the previous slide, we calculate the overtime wages, which was the second part of the formula, and then we add the two together, which was the final conclusion to those sequence of expression or calculations. So switching well, uh, directions for just a second, let's talk about a programming language, because one of the things I think we need to appreciate about programming languages that it has very much the same formal structure as English. We can look at a programming language as a language to communicate with a computer or a piece of hardware, not always a computer in the classic sense. So it's a language with strict grammar rules, symbols, and special words used to construct a computer program. Now, we might think of a language like the English language as one that has a strict grammar. A string, every sentence must have a noun and a verb. Every sentence must have punctuation at the end. Those are rules or grammatical rules. There are certain symbols that are used for that punctuation. And there are specific words that are used by the language that has specific meaning in order to construct a sentence or, in this case, even a lecture, which is what I'm conducting right now. Now, We've talked about the analysis phase of our system development or programming life cycle. Let's talk about the next phase, which is the implementation phase. Implementing our algorithm is a process of translating the algorithm from our pseudocode or structured chart and our flowchart into a written coding language. And in this case, we're going to use C++ this semester. And here are just some terms that we use in our C++ program development documentation, our written comments at the end of lines that say what our algorithm has been used to do in terms of C++ language. A compiler is a process of translating <coughs> our programming language or our source code into machine language. 
And then there's our main program, which is one that calls all of our algorithms. <coughs> Let's cut for a minute.